Well, <clears throat> when we found that uh, there was no way in which we would feel uh, possible for us to stay at the Moore School with uh, Dr. Travis's way of restricting what we could do. <clears throat> why we uh, had to make other plans. Uh, I might mention that just at that time when Dr. Travis was trying to get us to sign those patents to uh, the university, it was also the time at which uh, some large companies were trying to get hold of those patents and were told by Aberdeen that uh, they didn't control them, They'd come up to the Moore School and see what they could find out. And so we were told when conference with these people that we were to say that the contracts, uh, the, uh, uh, the situation with regard to the patents was under negotiation and we couldn't say anything right then. And uh, apparently the negotiation was to be that uh, the showdown as to whether we were going to sign that agreement or not. At any rate, the uh, uh, we had to look to a place like the Census Bureau to possibly get funding. And the only way we knew that was to now was to uh, set up a company of our own. And so as of 31st of March, why we looked more strongly into that possibility and everything seemed to be going in that direction except that the money which the government had uh, in the census budget could not be used for research and development and what we were proposing to do was considered to be research and development. So the only way they saw to handle that was to transfer the funds from the uh, Census Bureau to the Bureau of Standards, which is another part of the Department of Commerce. And they could do research and development contracts so all we had to do was wait until that was accomplished. Well, that took months to accomplish. And in the meantime, we had nothing to do, really, except that all of a sudden, a job turned up. The offer was made to us that we help organize a course at the University of Pennsylvania, at the Moore School, a course to tell people how to design electronic digital computers. And this course uh, would be conducted by inviting in a lot of persons to lecture and in part, of course, to have Eckert and myself and Kite Sharpless and someone else, Brad Shepard or somebody, give lectures on various design features uh, which we thought would be useful to people who were now interested in building electronic digital computers. And who would be the people, the class uh, students? Well, that wasn't of our choosing, of course. Uh, the government was paying for this course, and the people that were, had a right to come to this course and were invited to the course were government contractors, presumably. So we never had an idea as to just who would be invited to be the students. We were merely hired to organize the course and get uh, the people who would help us give lectures on the subject. Uh, we found that uh, Dr. Von Neumann was not available, and uh, some other people that we hoped to get uh, seemed not to be available. But we got a, a surprising number of people to give a course which is known all over the world, I guess, now as the Moore School Lectures of 1946 on computer design. And that, like the other things that had to do with the NEX uh, design and the reports on it, uh, suffered. In this case, it wasn't classified. It suffered from the fact that uh, immediate publication uh, was not uh, feasible, apparently. It got delayed, and 
wide publication was never uh, somehow accomplished. We gave those lectures, we organized the course, we gave those lectures in the summer of 46. And a long time later, I don't know whether it was 47 or when, why we were finally given the manuscripts which had been transcribed from wire recordings. The only thing that seemed to be available in those days for making a recording was a Webster wire recorder, Webster, Chicago. And if a wire didn't get tangled up, which it sometimes did, why then they could run it back and uh, if the stenographers could understand the words being used, why they'd get some kind of a transcript. Unfortunately, myself and others sometimes went to the blackboard and said, now this and this go into that or something, and the this and that's never were clear when the text was transcribed. <laughs> but we did our best when we got the manuscripts to try to fill in and make sense out of all of this. And eventually, the stuff was, I think, mimeographed and bound in a very limited edition and the people that had been in the course apparently got copies by that time. Anyone that was able to make use of what was presented in that class must have done it through memory and good notes taken at the time because the lectures thereafter, when they were published, must have been only useful to people who had never been there and who wanted to know what went on. At any rate, there were a number of people from uh, various industry and academic circles. Frank Rizzo, uh, I don't know whether he was from the telephone company or the MIT. It sounds like MIT to me, but uh, a whole list of people. And uh, we uh, performed, I think, uh, about as good a function as we could in getting people educated and pro spreading the word, you might say, as to what was possible. We presented uh, different ideas, not just uh, one way of doing things, but for instance with the uh, memory and storage problem, we rather th thoroughly discussed the use of cathode ray tubes for electronic beams directed to storage on the face of the tube, as well as the kind that we thought was most hopeful at the moment. Uh, the storage of patterns in these mercury uh, liquid sound waves. And uh, so it wasn't too surprising that uh, a couple of foreigners turned up in this course because uh, apparently, again, whether the government uh, had reasons for inviting them or just how they were got there, why they uh, there was uh, Morris Wilkes of Cambridge and uh, the uh, F.C. Williams of uh, Manchester. And uh, there may have been uh, some others that I don't uh, recall now or recognize, but they, these two people showed up perhaps a little late for the course, but uh, they were there in time enough to not only partake in some of the lectures, but to talk around with the various people at the staff then and get the idea as to what could be done on their side of the ocean, which they apparently intended to do. And uh, so you so later, why well, of course we got the word through the newspapers that F.C. Williams had a computer running at Manchester and that uh, Ferranti Company was licensing under some of the patents and pretty after a while IBM was licensing under these patents of Williams. Well, we didn't even uh, know when the patents would move in this country, but uh, they had English patents at that time, of course. And uh, so then uh, the other man that was there, uh, the uh, Morris Wilkes from Cambridge, he went back with a firm resolve, I think, to uh, have one of those 
things right away and to build it as uh, expeditiously as possible, which meant scale down some of the operating characteristics. Whereas we were talking, hopefully, about using pulse rates of maybe a million per second in these storage tubes. Why uh, he went down to a half million per second just to make it a little easier so he could not have to work so hard to get something running. And uh, while we were talking about uh, magnetic tape as our medium, as what I would expect to happen and uh, uh, hope to happen, why I believe that uh, he got into operation with punch paper tape. Well, that had been the appropriate thing over there for quite a while because the engineers of the post office, who had also been involved in cryptographic work, had been doing an awful lot of good things with punch paper tape. And so uh, by some of these compromises on just how far you want to go to achieve excellence and speed and all these things, why well, uh, you could get into business a lot faster. And that's what they did at Cambridge Labs under Wilkes. And uh, so in 1940, uh, Nine was it? Why well, uh, the Cambridge people announced that they had a start program computer of the EDSAC type going. They called it EDVAC. I mean, they called it EDSAC rather, whereas we called ours EDVAC. And uh, so their EDSAC computer uh, was in operation and demonstrated to people around May, I believe. And uh, so the whole world, you might say, by that time, not only knew that there were electronic computers that were a lot better than the ENIAC, because they required less tubes to do more and store more, but they also uh, got the idea that the knowledge of how to do this all came from a certain book, which uh, had been circulated by Goldstein, as all the newspaper reports from the English sector were crediting a certain work called uh, uh, How to Design an EDVAC uh, by John von Neumann. And there was nothing to indicate that the ideas came from anywhere else. Small wonder, I guess, that people started talking about von Neumann computers especially further that our uh, new helper, von Neumann, as soon as he had the ideas fully uh, under his belt, you might say, well digested and well organized for himself, started accepting invitations from almost anywhere about the wonders of these computers and what could be done with them. And uh, it was something that I just didn't know how to cope with when I'd hear from the people and my friends in Washington that when Neumann is going to speak on computers down at the Navy building so-and-so tomorrow. And I said, well, I guess I'll be there. I get down there, and I was perfectly welcome to come in. It wasn't a closed meeting at all. And I would sit perhaps in the front row there, you know, while when Neumann got up there and his smiling and jovial face telling all about the wonders of these new computers, and he'd never even mention the fact that he saw me in the audience. I thought that was a little peculiar, you know? <laughs> so, as I, uh, but I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to do about this. So I just uh, uh, took it, you might say. I just uh, relaxed and uh, figured, well, uh, surely people will gradually know what's going on here. and uh, But uh, there's no question about it. He was a charming and a logical speaker, and he carried the interest of the audience. and Everything made him the number one promotion man for spreading the word about how useful these computers could be in the scientific work. And I think as far as he was concerned, that was the main thing, the scientific work.
He wanted to see them used in science. This brings to mind instantly a story about uh, Howard Aiken. It came uh, later in time that uh, when there were Univacs uh, available, uh, the Univacs had been delivered to Census and other places, that one was given by the Remington Rand Corporation to uh, Aiken's computational laboratory at Harvard. And on that occasion, why uh, we were there with Aiken and the President Pusey of Harvard and others to commemorate this occasion. And uh, President Pusey asked Aiken, well, did you ever think that there would be so many computers or that they'd be so useful and have all these commercial uses and so forth? And Aiken very honestly said, no. I never thought of their commercial uses. He had really expressed the idea earlier that one of these Mark Ones that he had built with the help of IBM, one of those would be sufficient to meet all the scientific needs of the country. And uh, so that was all that had to be done, you know. Later on, why the Air Force and the Navy and so forth convinced him to accept contracts for Mark II and Mark III and Mark IV. And he began to see that uh, there was more need, but he still thought of it as a scientific need. The commercial need hadn't uh, apparently gotten through to him. He didn't realize that uh, although the, many of the commercial problems, such as payroll, uh, seemed to be just very small little uh, fragments and not a, a nice large uh, fabric which is woven in some intricate way that the, the machines were necessary for dealing with those fragments as well, mass production <laughs> items really. So that's uh, the way in which that Moore School course started the ball rolling, you might say, toward uh, computers both in this country and in England. Uh, as we know, there were other efforts in Germany uh, during the war, the, Dr. Zeus's work. There was Lagerbachs and other things in France, all of which were efforts to try to get faster and better computing devices. But uh, Dr. Zuzu was sort of bombed out and didn't have Hitler's confidence. The other people didn't get there. And so I guess the first uh, commercial efforts in England uh, came about because uh, of F.C. Williams and uh, the company he licensed. The Manchester patents then became, uh, came into commercial use. And the next thing we know, he was licensing IBM in this country under those patents. And there's still patent uh, maneuvering and litigation going on with respect to American and European uh, patent ideas on these. Well, I've taken you up to the point where uh, Eckert and I decided we were going to go into business. We thought we had the uh, confidence and cooperation of the Census Bureau if only the legal requirement was met that the money be transferred to Census and uh, we could make our contract with them and carry on. That seemed very simple and straightforward that uh, Census had agreed with us that uh, the $300,000 which they had available, the year-end funds, you know, unallotted yet, uh, would be uh, adequate. And, uh, they could uh, spare it, rather, and we had agreed that we thought we could do something for that. Only to find, of course, that when the money finally did get transferred to the Census, to the uh, Bureau of Standards, that uh, Dr. J. H. Curtis who was newly appointed then to Division 11, having to do with computers and mathematical tables and such things. Dr. J.H. Curtis and his uh, division 
required 15 percent of this money to pay their overhead. So what, where we thought we had $300,000 to do a first cut at a commercial UNIVAC, why uh, we had $45,000 less than that. That was a considerable cut as far as we were concerned. But when we were notified that the money had been passed over, why we rushed down and we negotiated these contracts between Eckert Mockley, or they called it electronic control then, Eckert and I did, and we neg negotiated the agreements with the Bureau of Standards people and uh, started to work. But that was September when that started, you see. It was then that we went out and hired a couple of people and found a building in which to work, a 1215 Walnut Street over a <coughs> clothing store that was just being <coughs> <clears throat> remodeled so as to uh, take a big plate glass window in front. <coughs> and from then on, why uh, it's a long, long story as to uh, how we managed to keep financed because uh, we didn't have any real capital of our own. And after several attempts at that, why uh, we finally wound up in the arms of Remington Rand. And under the direction of uh, Leslie Groves, who had been a general in charge of the Manhattan Project during the war. Well, that's a, as I say, a long, long story, and uh, has nothing in itself to do with the ENIAC and how we operated at the University of Pennsylvania. Now I can think back and add things, of course, all along there. But, uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether we want to uh, well, try to do that. Of course, or, I think, uh, we, I think. Now, of course, why, uh, Moore School has a UNIVAC. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, to some extent, why that stuff it becomes pertinent now, but it might not have been otherwise. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I was thinking about was the fact that uh, this job that I mentioned now the Naval Ordnance Laboratory as a statistician, which um, got me again in contact with uh, Dr. Maddow and his wife and some other statisticians at uh, Census. That job was Naval Ordnance Laboratory. Came about in a very curious way and does have a certain connection with the history of computers. They wanted me as a statistician, as I say, for underwater mines working on the acoustic principle and all the tests they were making. And the man that thought of me and uh, invited me down to see whether I would take the job was the same man that I had visited out in Iowa in 1941, Dr. Adnasov, who then was trying to build a computer. So here at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, I met with him <coughs> and uh, discussed the possibilities of my working. And I explained to him that I couldn't come down there full time <coughs> because I hadn't finished my job at Penn. <coughs> that I was in sort of indefinite status there because even after any teaching I had was finished, why well, I didn't know what the rules were going to be, how much funding they were going to get for further computer work, and I would hold myself available for them if they got funded. So, uh, well, this was in uh, the summer of 1944, uh, I guess, and... Uh, The uh, idea was that uh, just about uh, that time, why well, I, I couldn't figure out what we were going to do. I'm trying to remember now what that date really was, but the thing was that I do remember agreeing to 
come down there and I discussed this with Brainerd and I discussed it with Pender and they said well we don't know what we're going to do so you might as well take this job if you can get it on a part-time basis and hang on to it you know so that's what I told him I would do I'd take it on a part-time basis and I'd come down there say two days a week and sometime in there I <coughs> Uh, had to make an exception. I mean, they wanted me down there on September, right after Labor Day. And I said, well, I can't come down that day because I understand there's a new visitor, very important to us. Uh, his name is Dr. Van Neumann, and he's going to be there on September 7th or so, thereabouts. So I won't be there that time down at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory. But the interesting thing from the point of view of at Nassau and me was that I tried to find out whether anything could come of his attempts at building a computer out at Iowa and he didn't seem to want to talk about it. He wasn't interested in it as far as I could tell. And so I come to regard this, you know, in the same way that Ike Arbach uh, has in the remarks that he made about uh, uh, and that's off. He was a computer dropout. He just didn't seem to have any interest in computers. And I told him, well, we were working <coughs> on a method where we'd use a crystal which would convert electrical waves into sound waves, send them through mercury, and uh, go back to electrical, of course. <coughs> and uh, I understood that they, in the Navy, had some new kinds of crystals, uh, ADP crystals, they call them one in diphosphate or something, which were good for this kind of effect of going from electrical into sound waves and sound waves into electrical pulses. And so, well, he knew all about that, he thought, and he could uh, tell me a lot about that and so forth, and he'd made some calculations, and he went on about how useful he could be if we would just give him some kind of a work order which would transfer funds to him for doing more work on it. Well, we didn't have any way of doing that, of course. We didn't even know whether we were funded any further from the Army for this uh, uh, work on the EDVAC. <clears throat> so we didn't do that. But uh, from there on, why, I just served as a statistician in my weekly visits to the Naval Ordnance Laboratory. And then the most curious thing happened that just about the time that the ENIAC was getting wound up, I guess, late 45 and in there, they announced to us at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory <clears throat> that a bunch of money, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars, had been put in the hands of Naval Ordnance Laboratory to build an electronic digital computer. And that they had decided the best place to put that was in Dr. Adnasov's division. Acoustic Mines, which he was working on, only had a little bit to do with all this because, of the course, this, these crystals I was talking about were things that you could pick up sound with, hear the sound of a ship, you know, and detonate a mine and things of that sort. But uh, what anybody knew about whether those crystals were going to play any factor in uh, the building of a computer down there, nobody knows. All we know is that among all the places in the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, this money suddenly was dropped in the lap of at NASA. I thought, well, now here's his chance. If he really was interested in computers, boy, you can go to town now. Instead, he told me to write up some civil service descriptions for the kind of people we would need to have a project like that. And he told some of my friends who were working there to do likewise. And months later, apparently, the money was recalled because nothing had been done except write descriptions for jobs that might be filled. <laughs> no computers were ever built. There was a little bit of uh, uh, work by some people 
who knew about wire recorders because they used wire recorders in some of their sonic mine, acoustic mine work. And uh, uh, they did some, made some reports on how magnetic wire recorders might be used for input and output, I think, but uh, there wasn't much being done. And so the job was, the whole thing was terminated. And it always seemed to me as if it was terminated because Adnasov was uh, too busy going off and doing other things which he considered to be more interesting than computers. Yet years later, why, at the 20th anniversary of the ACM in Washington at that uh, uh, Sheraton Park Hotel, when Ike Arbach superintended a large panel, why, uh, he brought up the question of Adnasov's computer and asked me questions about it because it had been mentioned in a short paragraph in Dr. Richard's book. And although I didn't know it, why Dr. Adnasov was living just a short way away in Frederick, Maryland, in a house where he had retired having become apparently a fairly comfortably wealthy man from having run a company and sold it to Jet Propulsion Labs or something, you know. Here he was. He didn't seem to be interested in computers. He didn't come to the computer meeting. He never had come to a computer meeting. But he turned up in a lawsuit later. So that's one comment on history, you might say. You know that uh, this came before that because this is where I found out about the neon bulbs, and that I made uh, when I got a quantity of them and saw what I could do with them, and that was what I took down to Friedman oh. and um, uh, the other statisticians and things at Army Security Agency at Arlington, and. Uh, that okay, was my. Because you, you mentioned that before, so you could bring that in when we. Yeah, that was the first time I'd been to Arlington uh, since I'd been there for a date. I used to date a girl who went there when it was a girls' school, you know, a mm -hmm. seminary or finishing school, you might call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Was that uh, a cryptographic problem when you went there? Uh, 
well, it was enigmatic, maybe, <laughs> but whatever. Why uh, they still had the same buildings, the same fences and things, only more fences, I guess, and more guards. They didn't have any guards that I'd noticed when the girls were there, merely uh, duennas, chaperones. All right, do you want to start with this now, then tell well, us? Well, okay. um, at Ursinus, I was uh, uh, trying to find these uh, uh, cheap elements whereby I might get a digital computer built without uh, uh, breaking my pocketbook. And uh, I couldn't, of course, uh, expect to get any funds from the school for these purposes, which were my own research and had nothing to do directly with uh, teaching, or so I believed. And as a consequence, why I was very much uh, taken with the indicator fuses I found at a local hardware store and broke them apart and uh, opened them up to get the indicator element. The indicator element was a neon lamp such as you see two of here, one on each side of this uh, uh, post here. And those little glass capsules uh, contain neon gas, just as you have in uh, big advertising signs. And there's an electrical property of them, which I saw right away could be made use of for um, uh, digital purposes where either they're on or they're off. They're not halfway on or halfway off. Uh, you can restrict the current to them and make them operate on low current. You can make them operate on high current. But given other conditions uh, the same way, uh, once they're on, they're going to stay on. And if they are not on, they won't go on unless those other conditions do change so that you can momentarily put a electrical pulse on one of them, such as to cause it to go on, that is, to ignite. And uh, here, however, we've got them coupled in such a way by just a simple little set of parts underneath there that uh, I could get it to secondhand radio stores and so on. Uh, that uh, with three resistors and one condenser or capacitor there, why, uh, that was always necessary to make these two interact in such a way that if one went on, it immediately turned the other one off. And that was symmetric. Whichever one went on, it turned the other one off. But the conditions further were such that uh, this uh, condenser back there gradually changed its charge and as a result why uh, everything symmetrically reversed a little while later and the one that was on uh, was turned off by the fact that the other one now had a, enough voltage to go on. So the seesaw is back and forth and back and forth. That was my first uh, cheap binary counter. Uh, some people would call it a flip-flop or a bistable circuit, all kinds of uh, fancy names for these things, but uh, it all boils down to saying that there is a way of interconnecting uh, two of these neon bulbs or other electronic units so that you can get this kind of an action and I might add further, of course, that uh, it depends on how much voltage you supply to these things. I don't know whether we can demonstrate that here, but uh, if you regulate the voltage that's supplied, and that's all this box does is supply a known voltage, uh, you can change the frequency at which this vibrates when it's acting as what is known as a multivibrator, or you can make it so that it is just on on one side and then, by a slight interruption of the current, why well, you can uh, cause it to flip the other way. I don't know if we can do that here now, but uh, yes. Uh, whether you can see what I'm doing or not, I don't know. But the, 
Uh, now this side is illuminated, and that's off. Without doing anything except jiggling the contract over here, a slight interruption occurred, and so that one went off as a result of my opening the circuit. But when it went off, it established the conditions which helped the other to turn on as soon as there was current and voltage. And so each time I do that, so now we have what is truly a counter, you see, in that uh, it's counting the number of interruptions I've made here. But I can't interrupt it indefinitely and have it remember because the memory of which side was on is really how much voltage is stored and how much charge is in the condenser that's under there. Uh, there's a slight memory in the gas itself, but as soon as the gas, the neon, has lost its electrified condition, why then it's just a question of which side of the circuit has more charge, more voltage, as, as to which light goes on. And so with short interruptions, why this thing adequately remembers which side was on and turns the other one on next. And therefore, you can count the interruptions, whether I make those interruptions fast or slow, as long as I don't allow too much time to lapse in there. This ties in, incidentally, with what we did in the ENIAC much later, where we discovered that if we wanted reliable operation of the counters, which were hard vacuum tube counters, if we wanted reliable operation of those things, one of the things we had to do to ensure the best reliability was to precede the actual ring counter circuit with a pulse former so that the, the voltage pulses which we were feeding to that circuit would be more or less standardized and it would not have to react to a large variety of conditions. And this made good sense because the standardizer, the pulse former, was just a small part of the whole thing. And it contributed, of course, a very, very large part of the reliability. That's the trade-off where you win. So with adding a little bit, the pulse former, well, you get a great advantage. As has been said many times, and we can say it again, something which you think may calculate or count or compute is of no use to you if you can't rely on it. It's just lack of reliability is makes it useless and the first requisite then is reliability and that's what pr principally Eckert supplied to this whole project of making that electronic digital computer. But uh, I, of course, was faced with somewhat the same thing, and I can show you, for instance, a pulse former, which I built for a ring counter, which we come and look at later. But uh, right now, uh, it might be more interesting to look at the uh, what I could do with the uh, neon bulbs when I uh, realized they were so available and so cheap. Why I started uh, making other things, like a, another digital machine, which most people wouldn't call a computer. But indeed, it was a processor of information. What it did was to encrypt or cipher the uh, letters of the English alphabet and change them into other letters so as to produce a message which was so far different from the original message that it would take a great deal of time and patience and analysis before one could ever discover what was the relationship and how you could read the original message back from the sequence of letters that you was started with in the cryptogram. So that's, uh, I think, a good stopping point, too. Now. Um, let me, uh, I gave a little introduction there about uh, having found out about those cheap little neon tubes, which uh, I could get by buying 
25 cent indicator fuses. I then wrote to the General Electric Company and asked if they were the source of indicator lamps of this type and uh, how much I could buy them for. <clears throat> as, I, as a result, I got a hundred of these things, little glass tubes with neon gas in them and uh, uh, capable of being lighted up if you put the right voltage on and uh, then they would stay on as long as you gave them almost that same voltage. So I went and made myself a new kind of computer, if you like. <clears throat> Most people would call this a, an information device, a transformation of information. Uh, at the Army Security Agency, where I uh, took this to show it to the experts there, why we called it a cipher machine. What this did was to take letters of a message and change them to other letters so that when you got through copying out the letters which they were changed to, <clears throat> there was very little to show you what the original message was. In fact, you might work for weeks trying to figure out what the original message was. But this same box that I built here out of rudimentary materials, actually, um, contained the, the circuits also to decipher the message and tell you from the, the ciphered one uh, what the original text or the clear was. Well, some of the variations of this were uh, uh, so easy but so un uh, numerous that there were literally um, <clears throat> hundreds of millions of possibilities for changing the cipher and I thought that would be interesting enough to uh, the people in the government who had to do with simple methods of uh, putting things uh, into code or cipher in such a way that uh, the enemy of course would not read their message unless they spent just almost impossible amounts of time in trying to uh, figure out what the system was and how it was done, and what the keys were, things of that sort. This card I hold my hand, for instance, is an example of something simple uh, <laughs> which I applied to uh, this purpose. These came with vitamin capsules of the time back in the 1930s. And a little gelatin pellet was in each one of those holes as it was delivered to my family doctor as a sample. But the pieces of cardboard punched through those holes looked to me like such a beautiful thing and terrible to waste it. And so it would fit very nicely on top of these uh, little neon bulbs, providing I spaced the bulbs properly to fit the holes, which I did. And then I could write on the card, as I have at one strip here, the different letters of the alphabet. And then by putting that card on a different place or switching to a different card, why I had, of course, a number of variations in the cipher available just that way. And that kind of a variation is very simple to the cryptographer. That's known as the substitution cipher. You substitute one arrangement of the letters of the alphabet for another, but you don't change it. You just uh, keep it that way for a while. It would be obviously be a nuisance to, every time you want to read a letter, to pick out a different card and stick it on there. That wasn't the idea of this at all. The plain substitution aspect was merely a further obstacle in the way of finding out what the message was. The main obstacle was produced by the switches, which were these, just these two here, which rearranged the whole wiring underneath this thing. These three switches were just the best way I knew out the moment of selecting the letters of the alphabet. And if I had had what we now find advertised all over, 
a keyboard for 40 bucks or so that you can buy the uh, computer hobby shops and uh, all kinds of supply places. That keyboard, which is much like a typewriter keyboard, contains all the typewriter keyboard entries and also a few others. That kind of a keyboard, I would have used it at that time. But of course, at that time, why I didn't even find a way of punching in the decimal numbers on a computer available at a radio or electronic store of any sort. I'll tell you about that some other time, maybe. But uh, as of now, this is a slow way of putting the letters in, because that was the only the, the cheap way that I had at the moment to do it. And so, of these positions, of these switches, which have 12 positions, that was a standard in the industry. Why? Um, 12 positions isn't enough for all the letters of the alphabet, so we had to augment that with another switch, this little one up here, which selected among three possibilities. All right. Uh, what I did then, a little bit of number theory here, you see. I used nine positions on this switch and three on that, and that gave me 27 different combinations of that switch to represent one letter of the alphabet. So I said, OK, I've got 26 letters in the English alphabet. What's, what am I going to do with the other position? Well, I'll make that equal space. But if you don't like to have it equal space, you can make it equal something else. You could make it be another representation for the letter E, for instance, which uh, throws the uh, cryptanalysts off a bit. If uh, the frequency of the letter E in the English language is sometimes one of the things that the amateurs depend on for trying to figure out what the code message is. So if you just have two different things that both represent the letter E way, the letter E drops in frequency. As apparent, that is, it apparently drops in frequency from what you see in the message. Well, let me show you the back of this. This, as I said, made out of neons, which cost me about eight cents a piece, as I remember it. Bought a hundred a crack from General Electric. These switches, the knobs, are. I guess I had to buy them standard rates at the time, maybe 15 cents a piece. Goodness. I even provided this with a fuse and some hinges so that it would be easy to open up and look at. And in case somebody were careless enough to cross a wire someplace and the thing was turned on during that condition, of course, by it would not uh, cause all the lights in the house to go out. It has its own fuse, but it only takes some fraction of an ampere to run all these neon lamps. They're very uh, light current requirements. What looks the biggest and bulkiest in this are these two big things, which are the cipher changing switches. And how did they get those? Well, you go to the radio surplus places. There are plenty of them up in Cortland Street and other places in New York then. You go to some place where they are being pulling apart and selling all the kinds of pieces used in radios. And the great thing in radios then was that you have band switching. You'd be able to get more than one uh, range of frequencies besides the broadcast, maybe the shortwave bands and so on. In the band switching, you had these things that are called wafer switches. And I could take them apart and stack them up and make of them any kind of a switch that I liked, as long as I was satisfied with being able to get any one of 12 positions in the rotation. You can't see that happen here, but uh, all you can see is this little uh, flat shaft here which is turning the wafers. And it's only turning them a few places here because each part of each of these wafers now has another switch arm, so to speak. And so when I'm turning this switch by one position, I'm moving uh, three contacts on one, two, three, four, five or so different decks of this switch. So there's a lot of possibilities in that band switch and a lot more there. And by wiring these according to a system which depends on using 
the base three as the number system, this thing did a lot of things which otherwise would have been very difficult to happen and were very easy to obtain this way. So those 27 neon lamps representing 26 letters of the alphabet and a space, for instance, gave us 27 different possibilities which were feeding into such a change switch there. And then here's another letter which is likewise 27 different possibilities. And here's another one, 27 different possibilities. So what I did, you see, was to uh, make the whole thing uh, so that it made use of a very simple method which was nevertheless an unusual thing either in cryptography or in computers. We don't have many computers nowadays which use the base three number system. People talk about it occasionally, but mostly we use either base two, the binary flip-flop thing sort of thing, or we talk about a few variations like biquinary, like I'll show you a ring of five, for instance, which I built for that kind of a uh, number representation. But here, with the letters of the alphabet, I said, well, the obvious thing with all these nice cheap neon lamps was to have 27 in the bank here for one letter, 27 for another letter, 27 for another letter, feed in three letters at a time, and make it such that whatever the first letter was affected not only what came out as the first of the output letters, the first of the cipher, but also affected whatever the next and the next two letters came out to be. So as one turns one of these switches, he will see lights changing on all three panels. And if he turns the switch over here on the third letter, for instance, there'll be lights changing in the first and second panel as well as the third one. So the whole thing essentially works in triads it was three letters in a group all the time. And this was the objection which the Army Security Agency had to this for their purposes. Because if you lost one letter due to noise and difficulties of transmission in field service, which they were interested in, that one letter would lo knock out three letters because they were grouped this way. And they said, nope, that's one thing they couldn't permit. All the other things I did, very interesting, but to make it depend upon triads, three letters at a time, uh, absolutely lost their interest from that point of view. But they were very interested to discover that uh, what they speculated about this was not true, that if I put in ABC and got out, for instance, PDQ, that putting CBA instead of ABC in here they expected to find the PDQ just reversed and come out a QDP. That doesn't happen. It's more complicated than that. There's a lot of complication can be achieved by just exchanging wires of digits in a ternary or base three number system, and that's what I was doing and making use of. But from the point of view of uh, what went on in computers, Perhaps the only interesting things about this are, first, that it was a digital device, and secondly, that it made use of these neon devices, these neon elements or components, as nonlinear elements. That is to say, unlike lots of electrical devices, they didn't just uh, gradually get brighter as you increase the voltage on them. Uh, their input and their output were related in an all-or-none fashion, you see. And so here we were with indicator lamps, which were all-or-none, either on or off, and furthermore, that in the whole thing, although everything is connected to everything, you might say here, why uh, the circuits that are possible will fail to operate if they have to go through more than one bulb. The first bulb that goes on 
it keeps the others from going on, and therefore there's a singularity, a unambiguity, an unambiguity of the results here. And this is describable, you might say, as a function table built out of nonlinear elements in such a way that selecting just a few input wires with a few input signals on them, you select all together here out of 81 possibilities. There's 27, 27, 27. 81 possibilities are selected by whatever you're doing down here. And only three lights light up in any case. Just one letter here, one letter here, and one letter here. And uh, that was, a, uh, to me, a very interesting exercise, building this thing. And uh, I don't know when I built it exactly, but uh, I demonstrated it down at Army Security Agency probably in around 1937 and maybe 38. Yeah. But uh, this was just sort of a little uh, frosting on the cake as far as I was concerned. I wasn't deeply embedded or interested in cryptography. This was just an offshoot. I was really interested in using these devices in computers. And uh, when I found that uh, perhaps gas tubes of one sort or another were going to be the cheaper elements for my purposes and cost less from the point of view of their power requirements and so on, well, then I went over to trying to see what I could do with counters which would represent numbers like 5 or 10, base 10 things, uh, on a um, gas tube basis knowing that that would be slower than the vacuum tubes which the cosmic ray people were using. But nevertheless, it might be the cheapest way through for me with the facilities I then had at Ursinus. So the students at Ursinus, many of them remember me for working on all of these things, even though they didn't know exactly what each one was for or what I, why I was doing it. Why, uh, they remember that uh, these various counters were being experimented with there. And uh